meeting as all other meetings. And I would like to welcome everyone to the arts and mathematics seminar. The seminar is organized by uh, the Department of Mathematics at Kansas State University. And we are very glad that you joined us today. And please note that the seminar is recorded. And first I would like to introduce our hosts today. These are Dr. Tatiana Fixova and Natalia Rashkovskaya. We are both uh, faculty members at the uh, Department of Mathematics at Kansas State University. And as always, we invite everyone to be active participants and you are more than welcome to uh, ask questions and make comments either in chat or just uh, unmute yourself uh, at any moment during the presentation and after presentation as well. And now it's my great pleasure to introduce our guest speaker today, Dr. Diana Davis. Uh, completed her PhD at Brown University in 2013. And after that, she held uh, positions at Northwestern University Williams College, Swarthmore College. And uh, many people know her famous video with a dance that illustrates her PhD thesis. So we, I think a lot of people in this audience have seen this uh, video. And Diana's research is dedicated to mathematical billiards and dynamical systems. And among her numerous creative projects is the editing of a volume illustrating mathematics published by American Mathematical Society in 2020. And this is also the title of uh, her presentation today. And it is my great pleasure to give the word to our speaker. So please, Diana. Well, thank you very much for the invitation. I'm delighted to meet all of you. Uh, too bad we're all so small and this little screen, but um, I'd love to meet you all in person sometime. So uh, if, if, we, if we come to a conference and you see me, please say hello. Um, I am going to share my screen here and I'm going to give you a warning that it's going to take um, a second to load. So, because um, I, I have pictures, you're happy that I have pictures. So this is taking longer than I expected, um, but you're happy that I, uh, so just so you know, I'm going to be standing in front of my slides and um, pointing to them. And people often say, wow. <laughs> and then they don't say anything about my talk. They say, how did you end up standing in front of your slides? So I'll just tell you while it's loading that um, when, you, when you share screen, you do advanced and then you do slides as virtual background beta, and then you open your slides. They have to be in Keynote or PowerPoint. They cannot be a PDF. Um, and if you have a lot of pictures, it takes some time to load, but it's gonna be great and you're gonna love it. So, three, nope, three, four, five. And this was, this. these were the trajectories that people were liking. This was like this family of trajectories that people were liking. The more you, um, you wind it up, the more complicated it gets, but you get these trajectories. And one thing you can tell with this billiard trajectory is that it's definitely not equidistributed, whatever that would mean for something finite. Like there's these dense parts in the middle and then there's these less dense parts on the outside. And that's actually really interesting and unexpected. So this observation that there are these dense parts and these not dense parts led to lots of new math, um, including for example, three papers by Kurt McMullen, who I know you had in your seminar like recently. Um, so, and, and this, this phenomenon of having paths that are not equidistributed is kind of a measure zero phenomenon. If I had just like looked at the web page with all the paths, I never would have found these. And so I found them because I was making jewelry to give to people and people found some of them interesting. And so then I went in that direction. So this is an example of how uh, making stuff really led to new mathematics um, and led us in a direction that was really interesting. So that's what I would say about that. So um, usually I like lists with three items, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna use this list with seven items. So here, here are what I'm gonna say are the good reasons to make math, illustrate your mathematics with something other than words, line drawings, and equations. So for one thing, the act of physically making something can help you understand the math better. Um, secondly, having a physical object like this can help you see what's going on. Um, third, you'll do better, better math if it's easy to try stuff. If you have things in your hands and you can move them around, it's easier than if you're like imagining moving them around. 
Um, if you have objects, you can fully use all three dimensions. You don't just make two dimensional pictures of three dimensional things. Um, immersive mathematics is arguably better in some cases than tabletop mathematics. And I'll say what I mean by that. Um, and then the last two things, a physical object can convince people of things that seem impossible, but when you're holding them in your hand, you're like, oh yeah, mm -hmm. I guess it is possible. And finally, get math out into the world, out of math papers, out of math uh, seminars, into other people who wouldn't have seen it before. So I'm gonna, this is my structure, and now I'm gonna give a bunch of examples of each of these. And as before, if you have things to say, questions, thoughts, um, reflections, connections, please let me know. So the first, the act of making can help you understand the math better. So this is a uh, famous drawing that was on the wall at UC Berkeley. Has anybody actually seen it in real life? It's gone now. It's been painted over the building. I don't know what happened. It's not there anymore. Um, but it was made by Dennis Sullivan and um, Bill Thurston in the 70s. 71. Um, and I'll, each of these things I'm going to say has a little reflection from these people. So Dennis Sullivan said, we proceeded to spend several hours painting this curve on the wall. It was a great learning and bonding experience. For such a curve drawing to look good, it has to be drawn in sections of short, parallel, slightly curved strands that are subsequently smoothly spliced together. It was a natural and automatic to do it in terms of bunches of strands of, in terms of bunches of strands at a time as an approximate foliation and then connect them up the end. Thus, some years later in 1976, when Bill gave an impromptu three-hour lecture about his theory of surface transformations, I absorbed it painlessly at a heuristic level after the experience of several hours of painting in 1971. So that's pretty cool. The idea that just painting this simple picture made it much easier to understand the theory of foliations five years later is pretty cool. Um, so make things, put them on the wall. And this is big. like. Um, this is the this this is the floor and that's the ceiling. This is a big thing. So uh, makes make big stuff. Um, and then here's Steve Chattel. He he was at ISERM and now, then he was at Stanford and he's somewhere else now. Um, and he made these little coasters. So similar to this coaster that I have here, his are made of wood, which actually isn't practical for a coaster. Um, but he um, was showing this uh, smooth transformation between this shape um, all the way to this other shape. So those, these 10 are stacked up in this stack here. It's a smooth deformation. Um, and then this is a different picture. And he said, compared to working only by a computer, there's definitely something to be said about producing physical objects. Looking at some members of the woodcut family as others were printing, allowed me to notice new features about the differences between nearby tilings and get a better sense of what's geometrically happening when one tiling deforms into another. So yeah, you might think, okay, cool. You got these pictures. Um, there they are. What could be different between having them on the screen and having them in, their, in your hand? But Steve here is saying, yeah, it actually does make a difference. Watching them print, we learn stuff. Um, and the same, I would say, I didn't put this in, but when we were watching these things uh, print on, on the laser cutter, it actually prints uh, the failure trajectory in order. And so we could watch it go in order, which was, it was pretty neat to see how that, um, how that develops. And my collaborator, Samuel, just got here. So hello, Samuel, good to have you here. So next thing, having a physical object can help you see what is going on. So, um, so here's an example. This one's from the cover of the book. And I would say the reason that I have some understanding of hyperbolic space is because people make physical models of it. Um, I can't imagine what I would think about hyperbolic space if I only saw a definition or the, the disk model or the half plane model of hyperbolic space. The fact that I can imagine, okay, it's leafy like kale. Um, or I have seen things made with triangles and, and these knitted or crocheted things. That's how I feel like I've gotten um, an understanding of hyperbolic space. So um, they said here, using crochet, I really tangibly felt the intensity of exponential growth. To cr create hyperbolic crochet, you add stitches in a way that their circumference of the crochet piece grows exponentially. The piece took hundreds of hours of crochet and weighs 10 pounds, and the circumference of the piece at its widest is over 80 feet. This one right here in this picture with these real life people under it is 80 feet in circumference. Like that's huge. Um, and you, you can really feel it when you make it. Okay, here's another, another hyperbolic space. So these are both negatively curved spaces. 
And these things are um, constant curvature shapes, uh, constant curvature surfaces with negative curvature. Um, and the idea is that they all have the same curvature. The idea is that if you take like a piece of uh, paper mache and you stick it on like right here, and then you turn it or you move it to a different place on this shape, that it would, it would go on well. It would like fit perfectly. And you can, so, so as they say, this project enabled us to experience hyperbolic geometry in a physical way, which offered interesting surprises despite our existing theoretical understanding. For instance, we knew from local isometry theorems that the paper should fold onto itself and fit perfectly, yet when holding the paper in our hands, it was hard to believe it would actually work. Like, seriously, do you, if you had this piece of paper in your hands, would you imagine that if you folded it in half, it would actually fold nicely? Wouldn't you think that it would sort of go like that? Nope, it actually folds over nicely, apparently. Um, and the same thing. So I actually have held this paper and I've moved it around on these surfaces and turned it and it really, it fits perfectly everywhere. It really is constant curvature. It's kind of cool to see. This one, this one is my, my favorite because I feel like I was there. So this one isn't in the book, but this is Catherine Lindsay and Laura DeMarco. And in around 2014, uh, when I was in, when all of us were in Chicago at different places, um, they were doing like matings of Julia sets. So here's the first picture. So the idea is you imagine taking this blue thing and this yellow thing and sort of wrapping them together. Like they all, the edges of one are gonna smoothly go into the edges of the other. And I remember people doing what I just did on stage. They'd be like, imagine, you can imagine it with your eyes. You can imagine it mating, they call it a mating. And then, and you're like, okay, yeah, yeah. I mean, I sort of believe like this pokey out thing is gonna go into this pokey in thing. Yeah, I believe it, you know. South America, Africa type of deal, I get it. Um, but then you can draw these pictures, which are even more convincing, I guess. But what they actually had was these things. So, so when um, Catherine would come from University of Chicago, where she was to Northwestern, where Laura was and I was, um, she'd bring these little taped up paper things in her bag. And I remember she'd like try not to crush them well on the journey. And so what, they're both approximations of Julia sets. Um, and they tape them together and it convinced them that they would work. So, uh, so I love this example because it shows that even though this isn't very accurate, it, it kind of convinces you that it's gonna work. And I love that. Uh, you may be thinking to yourself, uh, why didn't they use a laser cutter? Um, and I think the reason is it was 2014 and they weren't as big now as they, as big then as they are now. But here's one that does use a laser cutter. So this is Kelly Delp, a uh, project with Bill Thurston. To, um, to make a sphere using flat paper. So you can see this one is a sphere-ish thing using flat paper, but the edges are definitely edges. And then this one, they've smoothed out the curvature more. And this one, they've smoothed out the curvature even more. I mean, this like pretty much looks like a perfect sphere. Um, and so that their, their goal was to make well-fitting clothing out of flat material for a sphere and other surfaces. Um, Kelly's Kelly's dream, which I don't think she has done, was to make a dress for herself that exactly had the right curvature everywhere. Like for her shoulder, it would have, you know, positive curvature and exactly the right amount. Maybe for her upper arm, it would just be flat pieces of cloth and so on. Just like completely perfectly fitting. Can you, wouldn't that be wonderful? And you can do it. You can match the curvature perfectly with these like, and then smooth it out uh, along all these edges. Um, you'll do better mathematics if it's easy to try stuff. So I guess I was inspired by this sticker uh, on Samuel's computer that says it, uh, what better, better software, better research. Um, I would say also better toys, better research. So here's some examples. Um, so this is um, some circle packings. And she said, it's important to be able to print out the pictures and work with a colored pencil, a ruler and a compass on top of them. For instance, in some pictures, a human eye picks up ghost circles that appear to fit the geometry that are missing. I measured these with a ruler and compass to conjecture their exact form and then prove that they exist. So printing these things out, literally measuring them and using colored pencils. It's a great idea. Um, here's, a, here's an even, even more um, compelling example. So each of these little things is a group element. And then when you stick them together, you get the composition of group elements or group actions, and you can see th what the group actions do. Um, as someone who has always 
well, I, I struggled with algebra. I mean, algebra doesn't come easily to me. I work quite hard on it. I would say I would love to have a picture of my group elements. That would be so great. Um, so Kathy says, I learned lots of interesting details about permutation groups and group actions by creating this illustration. Um, and then she says something mathematical. And then she says, more generally, I found that playing with these tiles gives an intuitive understanding of the algebra used to construct their underlying groups, especially in the case of semi-direct products. I would love to have this set and help it under, help understand semi-direct products. Think of the theorems you could, think, think how much easier it'd be to prove your theorems if you could play with tiles. Um, the same thing here. So um, he says, these are fundamental building blocks for knotted and braided surfaces in 4D space. My goal was to create as children's toys, standard size models that could be snapped together like Legos so that it would be possible to make a variety of surface braids as children's toys. Like, would that be cool or what? If this actually caught on and you could have children that would be having fun playing with these things and trying to fit them together and they were creating uh, braided surfaces in four-dimensional space. Um, well, Diana, who is yeah. that? Uh, who is what? this person? Who is that? That is Scott Carter. Yeah. At University of South Alabama. Same picture. Yeah. Um, joint work with C.G. Kamada. Uh, yeah, so I had heard a few years ago about a problem, I think it was a problem in medicine or in the genome, a genome problem that genome scientists hadn't been able to solve and then they rephrased it as a massive multiplayer online game and uh, repackaged it as a game and then people collaboratively solved it in like 24 hours. Um, so making things fun and easy to play with uh, certainly creates better mathematics, could create better mathematics. What else? We can fully use all three dimensions. So for instance, um, uh, this, is a, this is sphere eversion. So the idea is you take um, the sphere, let's see, yes, with the red side out, and then you wanna turn it inside out smoothly so that you get in the end, uh, the brown side out. So it's red on the outside, brown on the inside. And, and this would not be difficult um, except that you want to do it smoothly. You don't want to ever create any cusps. So this is Arno Chafita, and he came up with a, a new, a novel sphere eversion. Um, but then the question is how to, how to really get people to understand it. I mean, two-dimensional drawings are a are really hard road. So he said, after designing a movie, uh, showing an original way of turning the sphere inside out, I decided to 3D print a selection of frames from this animation. So that's, that's the selection of frames. Um, unlike most physical models, I decided not to use cutout windows or to print a wireframe, but to have a surface that's completely closed. And then to see what's inside, the viewer opens the object, which is held together with magnets. Now that's really cool. So, so each of these is a different moment in the movie, um, carefully chosen to, to be useful, good, different. Um, and then you can, they're all sliced up and you can open up and see what's going on in the inside. So really taking advantage of three-dimensional space to really use so people can see what's going on. Um, so this is a visualization of rational points on a algebraic surface. Um, and I can just imagine that if you had them on your computer screen, you could like drag them, look at them from the bottom, drag them, look at them from the top, from the side. But this is a block of glass where rational points are uh, sort of burned into the glass in certain points, like smushed. Anyway, um, however it's done, uh, you get this glass with all these points in it. And then you can really, you can just rotate the glass and look at it from the top and the side and bottom um, and see how the, the structure of these rational points. Um, unfortunately, this is just a picture of it, but you can imagine how it looks in real life. Um, and he, this is Oliver Labs. He said to visualize these points in real life, we needed support material to hold them at their position because the points themselves are not connected. There's empty space between them. Yeah, not good for 3D printing. Um, laser and glass allows us to do this with a support material that is almost invisible, which is perfect for getting a good idea of the faceting structure and geometry of the points. So laser and glass um, also exhibited, you can exhibit this in a museum. We'll see what, some of this stuff that's exhibited in a museum. It becomes beautiful enough that, it's, that it leaves the, the realm of math papers. Um, here's Pierre Arnu. He said, so this is the um, piano curve. So this is a space filling curve. 
Um, and he said, when the paper, Piano's original curve, uh, sorry, when Piano originally wrote his paper explaining his space filling curve, there were no pictures. The idea was, well, how would you draw a picture of a space filling curve? It would just be a black screen. And so this is like an iterate of a space filling curve. Obviously, this doesn't fill space, but you can see how, like, maybe if you did some more iterates, it would be more full. You'd be like, okay, but it's kind of hard to see how it works. Like, here's maybe the beginning. Where's the end? How does it go along? So he was like, oh, I see. Well, I'll just color it from red, you know, through the colors to blue, to, to the red again. So um, with this picture, you can see how it sort of smoothly moves through the colors and then gets out to the other corner. So that's a nice way of doing it. Then he did lasering glass. So I put this after the other one because um, he was turning this two-dimensional picture into a three-dimensional thing. So not only do you have the X, Y coordinate of where the point is, but you have the Z coordinate of how much time has passed. You know, the T parameter um, is as the Z coordinate. So he said, uh, um, he made, he made, he did this in glass. And then he said, upon seeing this curving glass, I realized that the set of points below the graph formed a kind of strange hill with an ascending path passing through all points of the hill and that this object could easily be 3D printed, which I did at ICERN. This gives another viewpoint on this remarkable object. Similar models could be made for any plane filling curve. And it'd be interesting to make them to get a better intuition about the properties of the curve, the differences between them. So I think this, like this one, I can't even really say, how does it get from this corner uh, to the other corner? Um, I'm not really sure. I mean, this kind of gives a good idea, but this hill, now I really understand how it gets um, to the, how it gets from one corner to the other. So three dimensions, very useful. Let's use them. Um, and then immersive mathematics is better than tabletop mathematics in some scenarios. Um, let's see what I mean here. So um, here is uh, like um, a person-sized version of we're feeling foam. So the question is, like, if you were going to have bubbles in, that fully um, filled three space and every bubble had the same volume, unit volume, what would be the shape to minimize the amount of soap film that you're using? So to minimize the surface area, to enclose and separate infinitely many equal volume regions. And um, this we're feeling foam is the conjecture as the best thing. And so um, he made this, he had this participatory installation that we all uh, collaborated and putting together. Um, it, this is like roughly, it's a little bit um, taller than a person, this thing. So you can see uh, someone putting their head inside to really understand it. And um, when he talked about how he designed this installation, he said, I wanted the audience to have a satisfying tactile experience assembling the model. There's nothing like touching and manipulating material objects to form a cognitive connection with the subject. Also, the scale of the model was important. I wanted the finished product to be visible throughout the auditorium and pr to provide the audience with a sense of accomplishment. So um, being able to get inside your mathematics rather than just imagining what it would be like to get inside your mathematics can be good. Um, and I thought that um, Sebastian here had a good way of explaining that. He said, there seem to be two kinds of geometers. Those who imagine that their mathematical objects are something that could fit on your desk and those who imagine that their mathematical objects are room-sized, something you could travel through. I have always been the first kind of geometer, but I've been curious to experience the second point of view. A computer visualization on a monitor reinforces the first point of view. After all, the image on the monitor is only a few inches wide. Virtual reality, on the other hand, allows us to experience the second one. So um, I remember, um, so anyway, so this is him with some uh, hyperbolic surfaces and you can fly through and see how it would feel like to be inside there. And you can direct your movement with this little joystick um, with glasses on. So not just on your screen, but immersively. Um, yeah, and I remember my, you know, I did, I studied billiards. I continue to study billiards, uh, but I studied them in grad school and they were always on a piece of paper basically. And my advisor said, oh, I want to um, use the, the cave at Brown. Brown had this room that had um, screens on all, on five of the six faces, maybe on the ground too, I don't know. They had a lot of, it was immersive video reality. And he said, I wanna program something and go in there. And I was like, why? You don't need to 
why would you need to be inside your three-dimensional billiards? And he's like, well, how could we know until we tried it? <laughs> how do we know? How could we know what we could learn from being inside them? Uh, so I kind of like that idea, although I still haven't done it. So put on some glasses if you get the opportunity. Um, Thurston was trying to do this even with, you know, before fancy computers with fancy processors existed. So this is a YouTube video of a um, VHS video that Bill Thurston made in the early 90s, I think, where he had this knot, which is actually just an unknot. Um, and he was saying, when you go through the knot, you're in Narnia. When you come back through the knot, you're in Earth. Um, just to, so people could imagine what it would be like to go to go through a knot and to pass into another world. Um, and this is even better with, with modern technology, we can do this. So, so, for, so I put this paper here because this is the paper, this is part of um, Thurston's paper on um, the eight Thurston geometries. Um, I picked this image because I thought it was the, the best figure in the whole paper, like the most, like the best figure in the whole paper. All the rest of them were simpler or worse than this one. Like this is the best one. Um, and yet in the end, like just imagine how much better it is to be able to do virtual reality. So it, through these spaces. So Thurston um, uh, geometrization conjecture was that there are eight types of space, um, Euclidean, hyperbolic, some ones that we know, um, but then also these ones called like Sol and Nil so hyperbolic and spherical, which we've probably heard of, and then Sol and Nil. Um, and what would it mean? What would it feel like to be in those spaces? And so um, these are just still images, of course, from virtual reality um, experiences where you can go in and um, experience what it would be like with some hands here so you can see orientation. OK, so immersive mathematics um, now. I am going to show some videos. So I think what I'm going to do, all right. Stop. How do I stop sharing the screen? Oh, I know. Basic. I'll go back to basic. OK. All right. Sorry, I'm having a problem. Oh, here we go. Stop share. Whew. There we go. So much better. OK. Thank you, everyone. Let me uh, go over to my other thing. So now I have some um, videos in the thing. Let's make it happen. Okay. You can see it. Can you see it? Okay. Okay. So immersive mathematics is better than tabletop mathematics. Um, so I study flat surfaces. And when people give talks about flat surfaces, they say a flat surface is um, a surface that is locally flat everywhere except possibly at finitely many cone points when the cone, the cone angle is a multiple of two pi. And uh, what does that mean? Well, Here's what it would be like to live on this surface. Yep. So maybe you can imagine what it would have been like to be that person on that surface. Um, that was from my Dance Your PhD video. Um, so that making a video explaining my PhD thesis using colors and dance was a great experience. It made me um, think through everything really, really deeply about everything. And I highly recommend if you're at all interested in explaining your PhD thesis or any of your work, um, any of your work really, through, uh, through videos and dancing, I would recommend trying it. It was a great experience. Mm. 
Okay. And next, a physical object convinces people of things that are seemingly impossible. So for instance, um, uh, stereographic projection. So you had Henry Sagerman here in this seminar a few weeks ago. So you might've seen this before, I don't know. Um, but the idea that when you hold a flashlight up to this, uh, this little curvy thing, you get squares. Can you believe that? So uh, Henry says, a print is physical. You can touch and play with it, unlike a computer graphics render. Also, unlike a computer graphics render, there's no way to cheat. People are rightly suspicious that some effect could be faked with computer graphics, but at least they think they understand everything about a piece of plastic and a flashlight. So it must be a real phenomenon. So um, it's, it is very convincing when you have things in real life. So um, for example, it's, I, I have always, I always believed that it wasn't possible to um, make a, uh, a torus out of a piece of paper. So here, let me stop for a second. So where am I? Come back friends. Okay, so um, I, I do flat surfaces. So I have always said, okay, you take a flat piece of paper, you identify the top and bottom to make a tube. This isn't the most beautiful piece of paper. Let me try this one. You identify, you start with a piece of paper, you identify the top and bottom to make a tube. Okay, there's your tube. And then you wanna identify the left side and the right side. And um, yep, yep, it's a torus. And you sort of smile, mm, I mean, like just imagine it's a torus, but you're like, no, it's flat. Like there's no volume in there. And so the question would be, is it possible to take a flat piece of paper and actually make um, a torus with positive volume? Great question, right? And um, I, I have, I always thought the answer was no. I saw an um, very eminent mathematician claim that the answer was no, but look at this, you can do it. So this is Samuel and Alva. Um, I have a large collection of these things in my house, um, but you can, if you can just touch them with your hands, you can see, yep, it works. Uh, it doesn't self-intersect. It's got a hole in the middle and it's definitely got positive volume. Like it totally works. Um, and I think this is the most convincing way to go about this would be to, uh, to see, oh yeah, yep, piece of paper, yep, it totally works. Um, so um, Henry Sagerman had also made this out of 3D printing. So it's the same kind of idea. Up here, we have the flat layout of it. And then here is the... Uh, folded up version. Um, it may be surprising to think you really, you can turn this thing into this thing, but you can, it's here's a video. And with this one you can. It's a, it's a little bit fiddly to put back together again. It's not so bad. Just have to sort of get these things to go into the right notches. Yep. So there you are, you're convinced, right? It folds right up into a torus with positive volume and it was flat before. So that's pretty convincing. Um, here's a favorite one. I, I, I have the book open to this on my table because my calculus, my multivariable calculus students are, are, are thinking about hyperboloids. So um, Edmund says it, convinced, it presents a compelling version of a classic mathematical object. This is a one sheeted hyperboloid. The surprising material brick draws you in with the question of how it could be made. It is curvy. Even knowing the tool used might not help as the curved surface seems impossible to make with such a straight tool. It, this was made with a, a, a water jet, which is basically like a linear knife, just like a line, it's a knife. And you can move your knife however you want. It's a water, very fast water jet, uh, but it's always just a line or a line segment. Um, this leads directly to an understanding of the behavior of ruled surfaces in the hyperboloid. So this is what you're looking at. Um, it's a ruled surface made of lines. And so the water jet was made to follow these rulings as they went around, and then that made this uh, curvy surface. Um, but it's kind of shocking that that's possible. And yet there it is. I mean, you can see this curvy brick cut thing, and you know that the only thing Edmund has access to is a linear water jet, and so you know it must have worked. And that's pretty cool. Um, and then here's a really, really interesting one um, that is sort of shocking. So this one is what's called the Dirac 
plate trick, um, or also called the belt trick. Let's see. Uh, that's the one where you, that's the one where you sort of, yeah, you go like this. I, I, I didn't practice this. You go like this, and then you go like this, and then you come back and you're in the same place or something like that. Natalia, do you have, or Natasha, do you have, uh, you can do it, you wanna show us? No, okay. Um, anyway, um, the idea is that you get back to where you started. Um, so, and you can also do it with your belt, but I didn't prepare that, so I probably shouldn't try. Um, but here's a really shocking thing. So this, this, is, this is made of Lego and it rotates and um, there's a, he attached a string, which I'll show you in a second, but I'll just tell you the setup first. He attached a string from here to the top and then this arm rotated. Um, and for one thing, as this arm rotates, the little cube rot rotates twice as fast, I think, which is a little bit surprising. And then for a second thing, um, you would think that a string would get all tangled up, but it doesn't which is also shocking, um, which means you could power with lights. So here, let me show you a video of that. Okay, so you can see there's a little block and here's a string that's tied to the block. So you can count like how this red thing at the top is not changing its orientation and the red things at the bottom are going around and, and the cube is spinning twice as fast, I think, as the red or whatever color you want down here. Um, and yet that, and also that string isn't getting twisted up. Um, it's pretty shocking and yet it works. And if you see it, you're like, oh, okay, you made it with Legos and a string and I can crank it with my hand and see that it works. I guess it works. Um, and then here's a here's one. I mean, maybe you think this isn't impossible, but this is a, a different space filling curve. This is a Hilbert space filling curve. And Judy here has um, varied the thickness of the curve to make this picture of Hilbert. So down here, you can see the picture of Hilbert. And here's a scaled down version of this exact same picture. So you can see what it looks like at a small scale, or you can just take off your glasses Actually, if you take off your glasses and you stand back, it actually looks really good. This picture of Hilbert doesn't look quite as good with your glasses on. So try it, feel free to take your glasses off if you have glasses. Um, I like this one because, the, so Judy made this and she made it, I don't know, roughly two feet by two feet. It's a pretty big thing. And she had it framed and she held it up in, she just at a show and tell and just the whole place just burst out in applause. I think she got a standing ovation for this thing. It's just so, it's just so amazing um, that you can do this. It may be not surprising, but uh, it's really impressive and kind of cool. So get excited about space filling curves. And then finally, let's talk about getting math out into the world. So usually we, we write math in papers or give them in seminar talks, um, which are all very, very delightful things to do. But we'd love for people outside to, uh, to see the beautiful stuff we're doing as well. So for example, here's Sylviana Amethyst. She makes, um, she is really into um, surfaces with cusps. What are those called? Uh, okay, surfaces with cusps, things that come to a point. She's really into those algebraic surfaces. And so, and she's really worked hard on figuring out how to make them with a laser cutter, which is highly non-trivial because, uh, uh, sorry, not a laser cutter, a 3D printer, um, which is highly non-trivial because of all sorts of things of like tiny things coming together, support material, things breaking, whatever. Um, so she's really been a pioneer in, in figuring what to do. But here's what she says about getting math out into the world. Furthermore, the very small earring size prints, you can see them here, are robust enough to be worn daily. And the skeleton-like object is seemingly delicate, but readily able to be carried in a backpack or pocket. I continue to learn about how to engage the public in my research by having cheap, non-breakable objects to show them while wearing earrings at the grocery store. I mean, that's the dream. That's the dream. Teaching people math at the grocery store, not because you asked them, but because they asked you. Um, and here's Sabetta. So Sabetta also does 3D printed jewelry, uh, but does it in precious metals. And she said, I wanted to make, I wanted to bring many of these objects to life in a medium that complements their natural aesthetic simplicity. 
I chose jewelry for a few reasons. It's simple and elegant while still being able to show mathematical details. I love the notion of creating something elegant and feminine out of mathematics. So those of us who are mathematicians see the beauty in everything we do, but it's hard to communicate that outside the community. I believe jewelry is a way to universally share the beauty we see with others. So again, wear this stuff out and people will ask you about your jewelry. Um, I, I made Pentagon billiard earrings and stuff and I would hand them out to people again on the airplane at the grocery store and they'd be like, oh, what are they? And I'd say, oh, it's my research. Oh, really? What's your research? And like, that means some random person is asking me about my research. How often does that happen? Not often, unless you happen to be carrying cool stuff with you, which I recommend. Um, and then Oliver Labs again, um, he says, I'm, I've created many different 3D printed versions of such objects over the years. Classical sculptures. So these are like the ones that are at um, YHP in, in Paris or other, other math departments. You might have them in Kansas, I'm not sure, that have these plaster models. Classical sculptures, sculptures of them in plaster. And my modern versions, which are exhibited in museums, are usually 3D printed in white plastics. But these objects in gold-plated brass visualize their fascinating geometry in a much more obvious way because of the reflections. In particular, some interesting light situations with lighter and darker colors around the yield interesting visual effects. Um, and I like to show this because he mentioned that he shows them in, in museums. He actually shows them in museums, like not math museums, but art museums. And the idea that you could have someone who's paying to enter an art museum and then they will see mathematical sculpture is um, kind of awesome. That, that would be an, an aspiration to, to for sure, not only to have it on ourselves, but to have other people exhibiting cool math. Um, for us. Um, I know who else did that? Some other people have done like some origami sculptures are in the Museum of Modern Art, I think now as well. So hope I convinced you all these things. There's all these good reasons to uh, make, have interesting mathematical illustrations other than words, equations, and line drawings. You can, you can do better mathematics. You can use three dimensions. You can get inside it. You can do impossible things and you can get math out to people. So thank you. Okay, so let's uh, thank uh, our uh, dear speaker with whatever means we have. Yeah, so thank you very much. Yeah. So I think we need, uh, I have some ideas for toys for our research seminars now. <laughs> so we may need so. Uh, it's a good time to ask questions or make comments or just share some experience. So anybody wants to uh, say something? Um, okay, maybe I, I will. I will. I will start. So I, I wanted to ask from the very first, uh, like the wall which was destroyed already by Sullivan. So what is the mathematics being behind it? Oh yeah, um, uh, let's see, I probably can't show it to you because it'll take forever to load. But let's see, you imagine that you have um, a, cir uh, um, a circle with three points, uh, like around three points, a, a closed curve around three points. And then you take this point and you put it in between those two points. And then you take this other point, you put it like it's basically like, um, toffee like or, or you know those toffee machines that um that mix the toffee yeah it's like that you have a circle it's like a taffy pillar exactly taffy sorry not toffee taffy um you have the three points and this one goes it's like it's like braiding you're doing a braid basically but you had a circle around the outside and you're taking it with you as you braid so someone is writing in the, the chat that it is a like a tough, exactly the same word, toughy puller. So, and what what was the relation that was written there? That so, a. I think the three points are A, B, and C. Uh -huh. And so it was like A, and then B, and I think all you would say is who goes into the middle, uh -huh. right? Like this, if it's A, B, and C, you have a choice to put A in the middle or to put C in the middle. Uh -huh. So I think that was like to put A in the middle or C in the middle. Um, that was a relation, right? It was all a bunch of A's, B's, and C's, and inverses. Okay. Okay, so did anybody, uh, uh, so someone raised their hand, so can you just unmute yourself because it's long for me to look in the list who did this. <laughs> uh, it, it is me, Vera. Um, 
Let me just lower my hand. Do you hear me? Yes. <clears throat> Do you hear me, right? Yes. Uh oh. Yeah. Okay. Um, I would just like to say I, I enjoyed very much your presentation, which was very interesting. Congratulations. And um, I would just like to say that I, um, regarding the stereographic projection that Henry Segerman did, uh, I participated in a workshop that he did uh, around the same time. And it is not um, as trivial as it seems, not as true as it as as it seems, because he did it the other way around. He began with the projection, and then he, he inversed the projection onto the sphere. So it is not true uh, that that is not a physical object. He made it in in three D modeling, and then he made a. Um, a simulation in virtual in virtual reality or in, in in 3D modeling, but it is very interesting to see how it works at the end. It seems possible, although it is not. It was somehow fabricated for to to work that way. I'm not sure if I understood and I yeah. explained myself correctly on this. Really? Okay. Yes, uh, he, he first made in in the plane. He made a, um, a tessellation of hexagons, or for instance, or squares. I, yeah. my, my experiment was with, with hexagons. And he had a sphere, and then he um, the, uh, done it backwards f to the point of, the, of the, the light, the light point. He made projections, rays from the point to the, to the projection. And yeah. then he determined the intersection with yeah, the sphere. Yeah, yeah. Yes, it was, I did that. Uh, I did a, a similar model, but with the okay. hexagons. Okay. Hexagons in the floor. Yeah. Yeah, that's what he said. He basically made the squares and then used the edges. First, the and, then the, and then the sphere. Yeah. And then they were too pointy. So then he actually smoothed them off to make them easier to 3D mm -hmm. print. But you're mm -hmm. saying it doesn't actually work the way it looks like it works? No, no, no. It seems uh, that's a, that is a, um, a representation in, in virtual reality. Oh. Uh, it works very well. Okay. Uh, I'm not sure if he did that in 3D printing. If he did, uh, it was made to look that way, but it is very interesting. It works. It works very interestingly. Okay. But it is interesting to 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 model that that um, that sample. Okay. That example. Okay. Interesting. So, again, thank you for, for the awesome. comment. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, anybody else wants to say something or ask something? Uh, because if you don't, I will start to <laughs> ask a million questions, which I have. Uh, I have a quick question. Yes, uh, please. Hello, uh, my name is Sri. Uh, first of all, thank you for a great presentation. Uh, I'm the department head in the art department. Um, and so uh, I was very curious to see, uh, uh, especially I saw the images online and I was very uh, intrigued uh, with the process that they have produced. So my question really to, to uh, uh, the presenter, but also everybody else is, it, it seems that uh, mathematicians are benefiting from having experience in uh, using software, but also hands-on experience with materials. Um, and different technologies that are commonplace in say uh, a studio environment, like in an art studio. So where do mathematicians get these skills in order to co be, be comfortable and confident in using these materials and you know, these uh, resources? Or is there something that we can think of as a potential uh, need for, uh, for such sort of skills to be available to uh, traditionally non-art uh, demographics. Yeah, totally. Um, I think it would be great to, to train more mathematicians in these things. Speaking only for myself, um, in, in 20, before 2017, if I had probably heard of laser cutters, but I probably thought like, why would I ever, what would I ever do with a laser cutter? And then I was in this summer program, um, Samuel convinced uh, the leader that we should all get trained on the laser cutters and 3D printers. And so we all marched over to the design lab and got trained on the laser cutters and 3D printers. Like why? Oh, well then once I learned to use a laser cutter, I was like, whoa, think of all the things 
that I could make with this. And so we made, I mean, I, I've made hundreds of things on them now that I know how to use it. So um, convincing people that they should learn how to use it might, might, I don't know, it might be a hard sell. I don't know. Uh, it just, you could say, this is just for fun. Let's do it. But once you have the skill, it is really useful. Um, how do people, how do people learn? Well, um, design labs or maker spaces or whatever they call them are kind of hot right now. So maybe they're out doing outreach to math departments. I don't know, or people are just going because they're curious or, I mean, the whole point of me writing this book, uh, part of it was just to distill or bottle all the cool stuff that people are doing at the semester program. But I, I, I was thinking, I would love for people to see all the different materials you can use. So I, I organize it in terms of materials. You're like, oh, if I have a laser cutter, I know how to use that. Um, what what kinds of stuff do people do with laser cutters for math? Oh, if I've got, I saw that we have this 3D printer in the department. What do people do with that? Oh, I see a few things people can do with that. Um, so I think once you have the skills, it can be really, uh, like it opens your world. So we could do more, um, joint assignments. I, I know uh, like the engineering school was, it, it Swarthmore would assign things that people had to do in the design lab. Last uh, last term for my calculus classes, I made something they, they had to go and use a 3D printer to do them, like force people to pick up the skills. Because once they have the skills, you have no idea of the, what they'll do with it. So, so should, you, should you, I think, may I just jump? Because that's, I think it's such a, correct question because indeed with last 20 years we like scientists not only mathematicians we have more and more aids to visualize our research and besides these technical skills how to use all this software definitely we need uh, more culture in uh, design in composition in color in history of how we represent different things and uh, it would be great if such things would be more available for people who are doing research so that they could use it without, I don't know, that it would be nature easy for them to, to learn this, uh, some, some basics. So that's definitely true because very often you see some object that you want to put on your, as illustration and you suffer with the composition or with the color, you pick up like green and red and uh, purple and orange and it doesn't work and you think okay why <laughs> i need to show this so that's a very good question so if you start to think as uh, our colleague from our department in this direction and uh, something comes out uh, it would be great so yeah yeah i, I would love to reach out uh, and actually uh, brainstorm what possible sort of interaction yeah. I mean, so, what i what i really learned from here is that how the shapes that we are aesthetically appreciating mm -hmm. have scientific and mathematical uh, importance or rationale. And I think uh, the artists would really benefit from understanding that maybe as you mentioned that there is a pattern in terms of what we like uh, and that pattern is mathematically uh, quantifiable, uh, not just something as in, as in like cultural or aesthetic choice that is subjective. So I think those sides of looking at objects from a scientific perspective or looking at forms and looking at what we do aesthetically from another point of view, I think is really beneficial, I think, for art education as well. Yeah. Um, so thank you. Thank you for, so, for yeah, this so, presentation. I really appreciate thank you. it. Yeah, let's join the forces. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay, so we have a last, uh, just one, like we can make one last comment or one last uh, question if uh, we want. Anybody wants to say anything quick? Um, okay, so there are many thanks in the chat for uh, for the talk. So it was indeed really great. Yeah. Uh, yes, okay. So yes, and there is a reminder about Nexus conference. It's a very important uh, meeting. So just look at the PDF file, which I sent. Yeah, and uh, maybe, yeah, so in the chat. Okay, so maybe let's thank our speaker again. So thank you very much, Diane. It's really inspiring a lot of uh, things to think about. So thank you very much. And thank you everyone who joined us today and we hope to see you again uh, at other meetings. And yeah, thank you, many, many thanks. All right, thank you so much for having me. I like yeah, thank you, Diane. Yeah. It was great. It was thank just- you.